After her husband made a life-changing decision that she wasn't entirely on board with, Robin Rinaldi set forth on a new path for herself. It was a year-long experiment in an open marriage, and she takes us on this journey in her book, The Wild Oats Project, One Woman's Midlife Quest for Passion at Any Cost. And author Robin Rinaldi is with me here now. Welcome. Nice Thank to you. meet you. Thanks for having me. Okay, let's just um, start by introducing you. So you're a journalist, you're from L.A., and for a long time you're in this committed, monogamous, monogamous traditional marriage. Right. Just describe sort of your marriage. What was it like? What kind of state were you in? It was, um, I think, kind of a typical marriage, um, a very expressive, emotional woman and kind of a stoic, reserved man, but, but a good man. Um, and we loved each other very much. I had gotten together with my husband when I was quite young. I was in my mid-20s and hadn't had a lot of experience before that and kind of knew that. But, you know, you fall in love when you fall in love. Um, and we were together when this all started for 17 or 18 years. Mm. Um, and I think many people would have said it was a quite decent marriage. And I think, and I think it was too. I don't think there was a lot wrong with it, um, except that we were coming into a phase of life that was different than the phase in which we'd started. And was the marriage going to grow and develop into that phase? Meaning what? Well, in particular, I'm around hitting 40, and so, and he's 10 years older, so he's over, you know, his midlife crisis for the most part, but I'm hitting mine. Um, I'm also having a latent maternal urge, which I never really had in my youth, but is coming on strong in my late 30s. Uh, we knew when we married that I might want kids, and he kind of didn't, but he was open to talking about it. So we hoped we'd kind of move in each other's direction, but in fact, we moved in opposite directions, and so um, he didn't want kids. He didn't want kids, and I wanted them more. And he and he wanted to stay childless mm. more. Um, also, uh, I'm kind of hitting the female sexual peak at the same time, and uh, I'm a busy magazine editor, and I'm a you know hard worker with a long to do list, and I'm a faithful wife, and I'm a good friend, and underneath all of this, something is roiling, and it seems to have two tracks two very female tracks. And one is like, I want to experience childbirth and motherhood and all of that and becoming pregnant and having a family. And another part of me wanted to experience sexual liberation and being coming less inhibited and more mature sexually and experimenting. And I was trying to have both these things happen inside the marriage, and each one was coming up against a wall. Mm. So this is what created the crisis. Okay, so, so, so you hit this crisis point, yeah. as you just called it. And you and your husband decide that the best way forward is to have an open marriage. So take me through how you come to that decision. Yeah, well, Because it's unconventional, right? Yes, very. I mean, we're living in San Francisco, so not as unconventional mm -hmm. as other places, but it's still unconventional and uncommon. So. He gets a vasectomy, and um, the very week the vasectomy is scheduled for, I find myself at a friend's door, knocking on his door and making out with him. And I'm watching this happen. I'm like watching myself do it. I mean, don't get me wrong, I knew what I was doing, but the timing of it, I realize this, you know, this is either gonna end in divorce right now or an affair right now, which a couple of my friends actually counseled me toward, <laughs> just get it out of your system mm. and you know move on. Or I'm gonna go to my husband and say, listen, if I'm not going to have children, I'm not going to my deathbed with no children and only four lovers, including him. We need some time <laughs> to take for me to explore this and and experiment sexually, and and if I'm going to do it, I want you to have the chance. So explain to do this it. to me, because um, open marriage can have mean a lot of different yes. things to a lot of different people. So yes. so what what does it mean to you, and what did it mean to you in your you and your husband's case? Well, a lot of people have like philosophical problems with monogamy, and they just don't consider themselves monogamous, you know, by temperament. Um, we weren't like that. This was like we 
pretty much were monogamous, and this is what we were doing in, in the midst of a crisis. We were going outside of the box to deal with this crisis. Um, but what it looked like was we decided I, I would get an apartment and we would be apart during the week. So for part of the week, we could do whatever we wanted and kind of a don't ask, don't tell arrangement. And then I would, we would reunite on weekends. I would be at home with him. And we would, and that was how we were going to try to keep the marriage going forward. Work at the your same way through time. this. Yes, yes. Okay. So you're living in San Francisco at the time, which you say, you know, a bit more open minded perhaps than other places yes. when it comes to different kinds of relationships. Yes. You start telling people. And when you start yeah. telling them, hey, I'm in this open relationship, Monday to Friday, I live by myself, I can do what I want, don't ask, don't tell. Right. As far as it pertains to your husband, right. he has the same arrangement. On the weekend, we come together. And that's our time together to, to try and work our way through this and see what happens. What the heck are people saying to you when you're telling them this? I got a whole range. I got, um, I got some women actually like went slack jawed and were like, you're so brave. I, I would love to do that, but uh, you know. And then others were just, I totally understand that. Go ahead, I support you. Others were kind of in the middle. Um, are you sure you want to do that? It might not end well, but if you want to, and then others were, you know, this is crazy. This is having sex is no substitute for having a baby and you should not do this. And so I literally got the whole range of reactions, mm. which kind of showed me that the reactions were coming from those the people making the reactions. It was really something inside them. I'm curious, you, them. you said that was the, the range of reactions you had from your female friends. What did, what did your male friends think? A same kind of range or? Um, well, I, I mean, I mostly had female friends. Um, male friends would um, kind of, I, the, the reactions were kind of short. It was just kind of like, huh, okay. You, I mean, they were guys. Mm. So uh, I, I did sense a little unease. Um, like f with male married friends, I guess I, th I think it got them thinking, I hope my wife doesn't, you know, want to do something like that. <laughs> yeah. And so it's interesting that you went this path, path in this sense. You said you and your husband met, got married quite youngish. Yeah. Um, we were together a long time, okay. uh, so, but we, so were we were monogamous since I'm using a these words age. in quotes, you were a traditional kind of woman. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. What was your parents' marriage like? I mean, did you look to them for role modeling, which many of us do? No, no. I looked to them. I mean, and they would say this as well. Um, they had a very troubled marriage and a painful marriage. It was alcoholic. Uh, there was some violence. Um, it, and, and I actually spent my entire 20s and part of my 30s in therapy trying to make sure hmm. I didn't have a marriage like that. In fact, I think the reason I was, I wouldn't call myself traditional, I was definitely liberal and I was definitely a feminist and very progressive, but, but I think the reason I had such a, a stable, monogamous, semi-quiet marriage it was in counterbalance to what I saw growing up. So I kind of did model I modeled my life based on that, but mm. kind of to its opposite end. Avoid passion, <laughs> avoid lots of ups and downs, and you know, have something that's very contained and stable and, and somewhat quiet. Okay, I wanna read you some, something that you wrote okay. in your book. Take a listen to this. When I was 26, the minute I took my clothes off, my sense of self went with them, and it took days to recover. That's how it had been with my lovers before Scott, too. Regardless of feminism or birth control, I'd completely absorbed the generational lessons of my Catholic hometown, that every act of sex was something that women gave and the man took. Now, 17 years later, the situation had miraculously inverted. I was the plunderer. I felt larger instead of smaller, more powerful instead uh, of less so. Those are some, some, some pretty strong words. So let's, let's sort of unpack them. You talk about your Catholic hometown influence and the attitudes towards sex. So yeah. What do you mean? I grew up in a small town in, in Pennsylvania and um, very Italian-American, very Catholic, uh, went to catechism every Sunday, you know, all of it. And, and also just kind of in, by way of being Italian-American, traditional kind of a, a, a patriarchal kind of structure. And, you know, even though I grew up in the 70s and feminism was happening then, I mean, 
you know, the last thing you ever want it to be in high school is call, called as a slut. And um, we all tried to avoid that. Not that we didn't have sex or, or learn about sex or fool around at least, but nobody wanted to be known as a slut. And just deep down, and I'm not even saying that all came from that town. I mean, I think there's I say, a larger culture. These are societal sort of conventions. Yeah, and, and, and eons of history behind it. Just, a, just a, a primal feeling that at the end of a sex act, at the end of coitus, the man has taken something of your person and you are left with a little bit less while he's got a little bit more, which is strange because biologically, <laughs> He's actually got a little bit less, and you've got something of him. But, but psychologically, it just, you know, I was taught to fear sex, to go into it very vulnerably, and to believe that I was giving something away that I maybe shouldn't. I want to pick up on something. This all ties into it, but that you said earlier, that some of your friends called you brave and said, geez, I wish I, I would do that, or, or you know, certain... They kind certain, of whispered it, kind, but yeah. Kind of whispered it, right. Okay. So what... Um, what made you do that? Because a lot, I, I think I'm not suggesting anything other than I think a lot of women sort of grapple with that. Should I, shouldn't I? Sort right. Of thing. Yeah, I, what, I don't know what instinct made me do it. Mm. I, I didn't feel brave, and I write this in the book. When they would say that, I would, I would think, wow, I, that's strange, because I didn't feel brave. In fact, I felt afraid. I mean, I, I'd been, I'm a person who has anxiety a lot. so. It wasn't that I was doing it out of bravery or even any kind of plan or, um, or intellectual thing. I, I really felt this was all part of me entering this phase in my early 40s where I was really like sinking into my body. I had this craving to become more female. Mm. And, the, and part of that was just really doing what my body told me to do going with my instinct, which is actually a very scary idea in Judeo-Christian culture at large. We're taught, don't follow your body, follow the Ten Commandments. <laughs> don't follow your body, it might rob a store. You know, you, you, mm. you're supposed to think about what you do. And, that, and so it was very scary. And I was going with my instinct, but I, I wouldn't call it brave. It felt more inevitable. OK, I want to ask you about the generational thing, because in some ways, um, you and I are sort of about the same age, sort of sandwiched between these um, generations. Yes. Which is, you know, today's younger generation yeah. sort of seems to um, approach um, sex differently, more casual, yeah. less serious. Yeah. Not to suggest that it's less meaningful, but if I can attach those words to that. Yeah. And then we have our parents' generation, which is like monogamy, 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 and that's it. And that's right. sex all plays in to that. Right. Do you think we've reached a point, sidely, where, where perhaps the attitude of promiscuous sex being bad or wrong, especially for women, is becoming outdated? Well, I thought so. Um, I mean, I certainly think so when I look at gr girls in their 20s, when I look at shows like Girls on mm -hmm. HBO, which I think is brilliant. Uh, I, I, I think it's moving in that direction. But I, I definitely don't think we're anywhere at, yet at the point where promiscuity by a woman um, is completely accepted. I think there's still something very possibly biologically terrifying about it on many levels. Hmm. Okay, so let's go back to your journey. So okay. we're at the point, this open marriage is, is un underway. Um, and you're trying to understand yourself yes. through this. That's, that's really the goal. Yes, trying to figure out who I'm that, doing it, yeah. what I'm doing. Who am I? Yeah. Why do I want to do this? What do here? I ultimately want? Where is there meaning in my life? Okay. How did the men and women you slept with help you understand yourself more? Well, I found that most instances, I say sex was the classroom, but the lessons were not about sex. Obviously, when you have new partners and you've been with someone a long time, you start having variety, you learn things on just a practical level. But more importantly than that, I found myself expressing parts of myself that I had always kind of suspected were in there, uh, but, but I wasn't able to access inside of a, of a long monogamy. And so through the course of the year, though, I, I, and even many years after, and actually in the process of writing this, um, I just felt like I met 
many different aspects of myself, mm. different selves actually, that had been in there kind of lying in wait. Okay, you do this for a year. Yeah. Your husband, you have a don't ask, don't tell policy yeah. from Monday to Friday. So when you guys get together on the weekends and it's like, hey honey, how was your week? What, what are you talking about? Yeah, well, I mean, we were in contact every day and we would text and email each other, especially sometimes call. So it's, it's not like, you know, coming together on Friday was strange. I mean, we had been in contact every day. We, we just kind of kept it off to the side so that we didn't spend all weekend, you know, processing it. Um, we thought that would be less painful. But our life on the weekends was pretty um, just typical. We kept kind of doing things the way we always had, whatever, you know, whether it was going away for the weekend or having friends over or whatever. Our sex life continued. It was, it was um, not as strange as you might think. I, you know, this, the, the interesting thing here is that um, I think a, a lot of us want two things, two basic things, you know, stability and passion. And it's very hard to get those two things at once hmm. because they're kind of opposites. Sometimes you find them at the beginning of a relationship, say six months or a year in, you're still passionately in love, but the stability is beginning. Um, but after a while, it tends to move towards stability and away from passion. But in the, what we did kind of ramped up the passion, I think in both of us and even a little bit in the marriage at first, so that we were kind of recreating that time when we had both stability and passion. Um, it, it, I mean, it was a big effort, you know, going out of our way a lot to do that, but it was, it was a way of getting two like basic human needs that I feel are kind of a universal dilemma in marriage and even just a universal dilemma in life. I want, I want to be stable and safe but I want to be alive and take risks and, and mm. have adventure. And how do you reconcile that? And, and as that balance is sort of playing itself out over the years, so the, the passion balance going, is it getting more and more unstable? It, it just in how you feel in your relationship? Yeah, I would think that, I mean, I would say that over time it began to erode. Um, the longer we went on with this, the more, um, the more it was starting to destabilize the marriage and um, and even uh, the passion between us. I mean, it was it was just wearing. It gets to be it got to be wearing on, on the marriage. And so when we ultimately moved back in together full time and became monogamous again a, after about a year was over, we didn't plan it to be a year, but that's how it turned out. Um, there was. There was definitely a whole new situation like we were both almost different people, I know I was. And there was kind of a like repair work that would, would have to happen and or even we could just call it like a repositioning mm. or, or something. When you open up after a long monogamy, it's kind of hard to put it back in the box. Okay, so ultimately, well, we'll get to ultimately in a <laughs> sense. Let's leave them hanging for a bit. <laughs> yeah. What do you reflect back and after the year, um, what do you, what did you learn about the empowerment of sex? I think that there is a lot more power for women in sex than we've been led to believe, and maybe then even we're willing to claim. Um, I, 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 think, I think sex is a, is a primal area of uh, great learning and great communication and um, just, and actually like physical and physiological energy for women mm. of well-being. And, and when we really start to lay claim to it without shame or fear of being called a slut or whatever, I really think that's gonna kind of be the last, the last straw, like the last, um, not the last straw, the last territory of mm. feminism. And then it's, re then we're really gonna be unstoppable. That, and, I, and I learned personally that Sex is a very fast and direct route to self-knowledge. It, it, because it's so carnal and it's so physical and visceral, um, it creates very lasting and impre impressive memories in the body. Uh, you learn from it and process it very deeply and even quickly. And so I felt like I compressed a lot of growth into this year by like doing the growth instead of sitting in therapy and talking or reading self-help book. I, I like, 
I, I got my body involved mm. and I got my femaleness involved and it, it just really was like grist for the mill. And I, I really feel there's a lot of self-knowledge to be gained by sex if we can kind of relax around it a little and, and dive in. Let, you know, I, I'm a woman in my early 40s, have a lot of friends that are about the same age. This is the stuff we women in our 40s talk about. And, and I, I, you know, I, I've made the suggestion to my friends that maybe this is like the female midlife crisis is what you were describing. Because we really are sort of the first generation that's, you know, had to have it all, wanted to have it all, able yes. to have it all. And we're feeling yes. the pressure of, of, of career and professionalism and then the more traditional sides of, of motherhood or not motherhood and right. all that stuff. Right. Was this Robin Rinaldi just having the female version of the sort of like, you know, instead of buying a sports car or having an affair with a younger woman, is this just the female version of the classic midlife crisis? Pro I mean, probably partly, yes. I mean, it was definitely, the, I mean, what was driving this, this whole thing was mortality. So that's a midlife crisis, right? And, and we joke about midlife crises and we talk about the guy buying the red Camaro and dating the model and how silly that is. Uh, but it's a cliche because it's real. And what drives it is the knowledge of your death. I mean, it doesn't get more serious than that. Mm. So, I mean, some of the ways people handle it can look silly. Mine look, pro maybe looked silly or, or extremely unconventional or selfish. The midlife crisis is inherently selfish because you're dealing with issues of the self. Um, it's kind of your last attempt at self-reinvention, you know, before you lose all energy <laughs> for it. Um, so, I, so I, yes, I do think it was partly a midlife crisis, and I also think it was partly a very female transition, possibly even like hormonal. I mean, I've seen, uh, I've read uh, studies that say that in a woman's early 40s, she will typically, if she's never wanted a child, she might want one. If she has a baby, she might want another one. She'll typically get very interested in sex. It's almost like, the body wants one more chance to, you know, basically do what the body came to earth to do, which is create, you know, mm -hmm. life before time runs out. So I, I do think it was kind of a midlife crisis, and I also think it was a very female type. Okay. What ultimately happens with you and your husband after this year-long project? Well, we end up separating and divorcing, and um, and I end up leaving the marriage for someone I had met during the project early on, actually, who I, I only knew for a little while and then did not speak to again until long afterward. But um, that, you know, ultimately we, we part. But mm -hmm. I, do, I don't see that as... Um, evidence of a failure or a, as um, evidence that this did not work. Some, some people have asked, why did you think an open marriage would save your marriage? But I wasn't doing it to save my marriage. I was doing it to save my soul. It, without, I felt I needed to gather something into my soul at that point in my life. Without it, I did not want to go forward. And without that part of my soul, my female soul, what was my marriage worth? So I knew I had to save my soul first and then see what happened with the marriage. And the fact that it didn't last, uh, it, and I, I believe my ex would agree with me, we don't feel like failures. We were together for 18 years. Uh, we, had, we had one crazy year at the end there where we actually learned a lot about each other and had some of our best talks ever. And then we had a, a very painful breakup and divorce, which a lot of people have. But in the long run, most of it was good. And, and you know, I don't see an 18-year relationship as a failure. Hmm. And so at the end of the day, I mean, because some people are going to say, well, what, what would you call it, this whole experiment? Why didn't you just go from this conventional marriage to divorce? Because in essence, that's where you ended up. So right. here's my final question right. that I want to ask you. In conclusion, what are we to take away from your experiment with an open marriage? How, how are we supposed to understand that? Well, I'm certainly not saying to try an open marriage. I mean, most people I don't think are interested in it. Um, I, I think most people sow their wild oats in their 20s the way they should. This is really, there's no advocacy here at all. It's my personal story. And I'm very hard on myself in these pages. I do not try to gloss over or rationalize it. I, I'm pretty self-recriminating. Um, what, what can you take away from it? Um, I think, I, well, first of all, I wrote it for women, okay? And that's who I wrote it to. What I want women to get from this 
is, is just identification with the deep, deep feelings of wanting to connect with yourself as a woman. There's lessons I learn at the end of it that I go over it toward the end of it that have much more to do with just ways to be inside your feminine energy every day, such as you know, movement and music and yoga and your own creativity, being in touch with your own purpose in life and actually being around a lot of other women. You don't have to upend your marriage and upend your life like I did. You can kind of use it as a cautionary tale mm. or an armchair adventure, basically. <laughs> it's both. Thank you very much Ed, for opening yourself up and being so honest. I appreciate it. Thanks for having me. Help TVO create a better world through the power of learning. Visit supporttvo.org and make a tax-deductible donation today.